Hi everyone, and welcome to Queering Health with Dr. E. I'm Dr. E. I use they, them, theirs pronouns, and I identify as non-binary and genderqueer on the trans mask but make it glitter spectrum. I am the medical director of the Gender and Life Affirming Medicine Program, or GLAM for short, at Anchor Health. Anchor Health is an LGBTQ healthcare provider with clinics located in Stamford and Hamden, Connecticut. Happy Pride Month! Ah, yes! Yes! All right, this is it, people. Let's move. Let's go, 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 go! This is a time to celebrate love and equality and to remember those who have paved the path for us to be where we are today. By now, most of you have heard a variation of the phrase, the first Pride was a riot. It's a reminder that pride is not all about parades and lavish rainbow displays. Pride parades in the last several years have been overrun by corporations. Big companies have helped sponsor pride parades, but as members of the LGBTQ community, we need to question whether these companies genuinely support the community year round and if they're putting their money where their mouth is. Our predecessors fought for us to be here. They fought against the violent and constant police harassment of drag queens and trans people, particularly trans women. The 1969 Stonewall Uprising and the 1966 Compton's Cafeteria Riots are often discussed and highlighted to remember these pivotal moments during Pride Month. Most of us have some awareness around the names of Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, both of whom are said to have played a prominent role in the Stonewall Riots. In today's episode, we're spotlighting other trans activists in the United States, some historical and some current. So why are we focusing on trans activists? Historically, pride has consistently centered gays and lesbians, but it's important for us to talk about and remember and thank the trans folks who did and are currently doing the work. So in no particular order, let's get started. Miss Major Griffin Gracie is a black trans woman, an activist, and a Stonewall veteran. She is a community leader for trans rights, black liberation, and abolition. Miss Major was kicked out of two colleges for outwardly expressing her gender identity, and eventually she moved from Chicago to New York City. While she was in New York City, she found home within the local LGBTQ community that was associated with the Stonewall Inn. She was there when the bar was raided and a leader in the riots. She was struck on her head by a police officer and taken into custody, and a corrections officer broke her jaw while she was in prison. Miss Major participated in drag balls during her youth in Chicago. At the start of her medical transition, she had to rely on the black market for her hormones. She was often homeless and participated in sex work to support herself. During the AIDS epidemic, Miss Major provided additional health care and funerals each week. She has served on multiple HIV slash AIDS organizations. Miss Major has five sons, three of them runaways who were adopted into her family after she met them in a California park. She became executive director of the Transgender Variant and Intersex Justice Project, or TGIJP for short, to advocate for incarcerated trans women. She has frequently cited the prison industrial complex as a major factor in why trans people are incarcerated, especially people of color and those with low income. Currently, Ms. Major is working on building House of Gigi's, a safe haven and retreat house for the trans community. People need to understand that it's not just about us as trans people. It's about the people in our lives. It's about the people who support us. They need to stop supporting us from the shadows, step out into the light and say, I appreciate, acknowledge, and like transgender people. And transgender people need to live, be appreciated, be enjoyed, and be left alone to live our lives, pursue our dreams, and be the best people that we can be on our fucking own. You know what I mean? So, you want us to have a day of visibility? Visibilize this shit. I like transgender people. Tell a transgender person that you appreciate them. Acknowledge that you like it in public to your friends, to your coworkers, to your damn family. Don't keep us in the dark, on the side, in some little secret place in your mind. Step out, acknowledge who we are to you, and appreciate us like that. Thank you. Renee Richards is an ophthalmologist and a professional tennis player. In college, she started to dress as a woman, which at the time was considered a form of insanity and categorized as a perversion. Richards named her persona Renee, which is the French term for reborn. 
Renee had gender reassignment surgery in 1975 and played tennis as a woman without issue the entire year. She was outed in 1976 for having gender reassignment by Richard Carlson, who happens to be the father of Tucker Carlson, a well-known political pundit, Trump supporter, and conservative commentator. Because of Renee, the US Open introduced a required genetic screening for female athletes, which essentially barred Renee from playing. Good evening. Jim Lehrer is off tonight. Dr. Renee Richards, the 42-year-old transsexual tennis player, moves into the second round of the Tennis Week tournament at South Orange, New Jersey tomorrow. But she's no nearer gaining admission to the U.S. Tennis Open at Forest Hills, which begins next week. Forest Hills officials have demanded that she take a chromosome test, like those required of women athletes in the Olympics, to prove their femininity. Dr. Richards has refused to take the test and argues that her rights are being trampled on. At the same time, she's not unhappy that the so-called sex change tennis case has focused more public attention on transsexuals than anything since the notoriety over Christine Jorgensen in the 1950s. Dr. Richards lived as a man until last year. He was a successful ophthalmologist in New York and a ranked amateur tennis reassignment operation a year ago, Dr. Richards has been living in California and playing tennis as a... That was fine until she decided to enter Forest Hills, the major tennis tournament in this country. Tonight, the problems of being a transsexual athlete, and more widely, the growing recognition of transsexualism and the problems of acceptance in American society. Dr. Richards, you want to play at Forest Hills. Why are you unwilling to accept a chromosome test? I'm unwilling to accept it because I don't think it's a good test for sexuality. Sexuality is many more things than what your sex chromosome pattern is. Uh, socially and legally, your sex chromosome pattern has nothing to do with it. I am a woman. My gynecologist will attest to that. My uh, documents all say that I am a woman and I live as one. Uh, to be asked to take the test that Forest Hills wants me to take uh, seems unfair. Uh, they are only going to pass those women who have a specific type of chromosome pattern, and that would eliminate most likely me, and it might eliminate some other women with abnormal chromosome patterns too. She sued, and in 1977, the Supreme Court ruled in her favor. Renee is thought to be the first transgender woman to play in professional sports. Chris Mosier is a Hall of Fame triathlete and the first openly trans man to represent the United States in an international competition in 2015. This led to a change on the International Olympic Committee policy around trans athletes. Chris is the first trans athlete to compete in Olympic trials for any sport in a category different than their sex assigned at birth. In 2013, Chris set up the website transathlete.com, which offers resources and information about trans inclusion in athletics. In 2016, he was sponsored by Nike and featured in his own Nike commercial. If someone was to ask me how I would identify myself, I'd say that I was an athlete. I'm a runner, triathlete, duathlete, and the first trans man to make a men's U.S. national team. Getting into competitive sports was a way for me to see how far I could take my body. I wasn't sure if I would even be able to compete against men. I had people telling me that it's not possible. If I listened to them, if I believed that, I wouldn't be standing here today. Now I feel like the door has been opened. Every success that I've had along the way has been even more amazing because I know that no one else in the future will have to be in my position. From a very young age, Lucy Hicks Anderson knew that she was not male and identified as a female in a time before the term transgender existed. Doctors actually advised Lucy's parents to let her live as a young woman, so she began wearing dresses to school and being known as Lucy. Lucy married two men in her lifetime, fighting for her marriages to be accepted as legal and for her to be accepted as a woman. She saved up enough money after her first marriage to buy a boarding house, 
which served as a front for a brothel and also sold illegal liquor during the Prohibition period. She was also a well-known socialite and hostess. In 1945, a sailor claimed that he caught an STD from one of the women in Anderson's brothel. So all the women, including Lucy, were required to undergo medical examinations. Lucy was tried in court for perjury. The argument was that she lied about her sex on her marriage license and impersonated a woman. During the trial, she stated, I defy any doctor in the world to prove that I am not a woman. And I have lived, dressed, acted just what I am a woman. She was convicted because marriage was only valid between a man and a woman and she was not deemed a woman, so the marriage was declared invalid. She was sentenced to a men's prison. Upon her release, she and her husband moved and lived a quiet life. Pauline Park is a Korean American activist who helped develop a safe schools bill. She was born in Korea and adopted by European American parents and raised in the United States. In 1997, Pauline co-founded the Queen's Pride House, a center for LGBTQ communities. In 1998, she co-founded the New York Association for Gender Rights Advocacy, the first statewide trans advocacy organization in New York. Pauline also worked on the Dignity for All Students Act, a safe school bill which negotiated inclusion of gender identity and expression and was enacted by the New York State Legislature in 2010. This was the first fully transgender inclusive legislation introduced by that body. In 2005, Pauline became the first openly transgender person to be chosen as Grand Marshal of the New York City Pride March, the oldest and largest Pride event in the United States. In June 2015, Pauline was the keynote speaker at the Queer Korea Festival slash Seoul Pride Parade, the largest event in the history of the LGBTQ community in Korea up to that point. This had a crowd estimated at more than 35,000 people. There's no credible science behind it. There's no legitimate justification for this wave of legislation. The religious right has lost the battle, the war over same-sex marriage. And so they've decided to attack the transgender community and focus on the most vulnerable elements of that community, which are trans youth. Um, using a false flag of trying to protect uh, conventionally gendered or cisgendered youth from unfair competition. In fact, uh, it's just a ruse. It's an attempt to divide uh, LGBT activists from women, second wave feminists, others who might think there's some legitimate purpose behind this legislation, which there isn't. So we have to resist this legislation and defeat it because it is pernicious. It is based purely on transphobia and political opportunism. And it's just the latest uh, wedge issue that uh, the religious right is trying to use uh, via the Republican Party uh, to demonize and criminalize transgender identity. This concludes part one in our two-part series on 10 U.S. trans activist trailblazers you should know. As some of you may have noticed, we're off of our regular posting schedule right now because we're in the middle of some big updates. But don't worry, we'll be back on schedule soon. Click the thumbs up to show your love and support and also hit that subscribe button. You can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. AJ Eckert. You can follow Anchor Health on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Anchor Health CT. If you are local to the area and would like to schedule an appointment with me or one of our other stellar providers, the link will be on the screen and in the description. And in the meantime, stay safe out there. Know that you are loved. Know that you are perfect just the way you are. And happy Pride Month. This is Dr. E signing off.